Hi, this is Julia Witta with Talk Story TV, and we have with us today Robert Williams, who is going to talk to us about the role of the shaman. Hi, Julia. Hi. Glad to be on the show. Good to have you. Thank you. So tell us about the role of the shaman. Traditionally, I guess you're going to say, or are you going to split it up between how it was and how it is now? Let's, uh, you know, the, the traditional role, as your audience knows, and as you know, of the shaman is to guide the community, guide the tribe, to be the intermediary between the spirit world and the physical reality, mm -hmm. to um, get in touch with, often to get in touch with the nature, spirits, and beings that are uh, governing the, the crops and also the spirits of the deer and buffalo and so forth. So the shaman's responsibility was to make sure that all was clear, all was in harmony with the um, ecosystem before a hunt, before a kill, it would, and then over to when to plant the crops and so forth. You know, I, I've always uh, been so fascinating in the looking at the history of shamanism and its various cultures because generally, the the uh, the shaman was either the priestess or the the elder female of the of the group, or uh, or certainly always one of the elders and one of the ones who had grown up practicing the ability to go uh, between worlds and and be that spokesperson for the other side, if you will. So I I. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of meeting a Cherokee shaman, and the, I should say the honor, the pleasure, but very, very honored because I, I'm part Cherokee and I had to show my little certificate and everything to get way back in the Cherokee country. So now the, the shamans that are still around are, uh, they are of course concerned about humanity. They're concerned about what's happening on the planet to the planet. And now their role is more than now it's time to go hunt or now it's time to plant the seeds. Their role is in this particular case, this, this shaman that I met was to continue to um, be in communication with the nature spirits, with the gods and goddesses or the, the beings on the other side mm -hmm. so that uh, there is uh, so that the linkage between the two is not completely lost because it is less than it used to be. And the communication about the importance of uh, waking up as humans. One of the things that uh, I have learned is that we all have the inner shaman. We all have the ability to go in and out of different domains and that it's not currently only the ones who were born and raised in a shamanic family that have that, not only have the ability, but have the responsibility. So your, like your work is so important because it is not just physical or chemically based with our physical bodies. We're looking at the spiritual world and the world of non-physicality that uh, we need their help. And we need their help. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and yeah. the Earth, Mother Earth needs the help. Yeah. You know. So what I did when I when I learned a few of my own shamanic um, ways, uh, there's one technique I wanted to share with you and your audience, and that is when you look at somebody clairvoyantly, you see their energies, you see the different colors and the different you know auras qualities of the aura, lights, you might hear seeing, you might see relatives around them and so forth. Uh, but what I've found is that if you, if you look at a family and you, you ask to see that family as a whole being, you see one, like one person with the seven chakras and the energy centers, but they are the family. It's the relationship creature. You could say the relationship entity of the family, but you're looking at a unified, you're looking at one being that is the family. And then, I extended that out until I was looking at all humans as one being. Mm -hmm. 
And then you can see, in a general sense, you can see the aura of humanity okay. and what the primary conflict of humanity is faced with, which, um, you know, energy comes down from the infinite, goes into Mother Earth to the infinite, the core of the Earth, back up, and, you know, there's a fascinating way it works. But one of the... Uh, one of the challenges for humans is that there is a big block, not up on the camera, between our hearts and our solar plexuses. So the energy is coming down. There's a lot of us that can see other worlds and speak higher knowledge and wisdom. And then we have our hearts, which is unconditional love and ways in which unconditional love is, can, can serve moment to moment. And then we have our lower chakras, which is start with just in general um, we have to feed and be uh, protect our young and, and so uh, those are the signals of our first chakra and then we, it, it's now time to do this and not that it, you know and, and then the solar plexus is the will to go out and plant the seed or uh, kill the deer or whatever but the will has as we all know gotten way too much uh, influence uh, in our lives and so there's this big when I was looking at humanity so like just there is this huge block between the solar plexus and the heart almost like this knot this dark uh, tightness contracted contraction of energy mm -hmm. and so even though there are a lot of us uh, fortunately that are understanding love, understanding our place in the unified field, our, our location in the universe as a human and as a human individual, um, because of mass consciousness, it is difficult to ground that love into, uh, you could say, into a practical way in our lives. And it's just the phase we're in, it will eventually happen. But that's why the communities, because to, to bridge that gap between the heart and the lower, lower chakras or the solar plexus, to combine unconditional love with the power of our will and the ability to go out and you know, do things, is very much in conflict because of this gap. And uh, so maybe I'll ask you, the, the, uh, the, the uh, information I received in in looking at that phenomenon as part of humanity, I actually felt it in my own chakras. So when I get uh, afraid or concerned or I see something, I feel a little tightness in my solar plexus. So that, that tightness is, is, is a symptom or it's part of the wound of humanity. So to, to heal that wound, um, we start with ourselves. We identify that tightness. Most of us actually don't even know it's tight until we get like a good massage and we realize, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and especially just during normal day things and outside of meditation. And, and um, because of the web of life, because of the power and the beneficial dispositions that have been given to humans to to make it this time, to break through the, the ignorance, to break through the fear and selfish uh, attributes uh, that are prevalent these days because of this danger. The shamans, back to the guy, uh, the shaman I met in, in the Cherokee land, he would just stay there in that combination of love and will and just meditate and he had me meditate meditate there and eventually the will will realign itself with the heart as opposed to mass consciousness as opposed to the wound of humanity and the, and it's a simple practice we can do each day it's just at first of identifying that knot that um, wound mm -hmm. that we all share you know, to a certain degree anyway, and the intuition 
of our own light, of our own love, and of our own unity. Be there with that, with those, with that polarity. <clears throat> what I found is that if I don't try to fix it or merge it or bridge it or you know, if I get out of my mind, get into, uh, submit into a place of the gap between worlds, between life and death, which is the shaman's domain. Then I was, I'm, I'm able to heal that in my own being and it goes through my family and goes outward like that. <laughs> what do you think about that, Julia? I like that. I like that. I'm, I've noticed, I'm concerned about the earth. Yeah. And I've noticed it really has to start on an individual level. Exactly. And that's what, why I thought, well, we need, we need some people to be here, physically come here and be here with the people who are trying to evolve. Even for, if it's just for a couple of days, it helps. It, it, it's very important. It's so important. It's not, you know, I think the community that you've gathered knows that we're all connected. We have that intuition. We don't have to try to explain it with quantum physics or anything. They have that intuition of <laughs> our interconnectedness, not only with our human community, but with all the different uh, species and uh, compartments and the values of the earth spectrum of, of existence. We are all part of that and we affect it. And when that merging of the, when that wound in our solar plexus, um, or you could say when we identify our own fears, you see the, the fear is saying to the solar plexus, we have to go out and do something to find safety. And at certain times in human evolution, the historical past, that was important. We were threatened in a tribal sense, the tigers, or well, I guess not tigers, but whatever, the wild animals. Lions and tigers and bears. Lions <laughs> and bears and, and <laughs> dragons, right? They, you know, uh, they were, we had to, to be able to capture that powerful energy, go out and defend ourselves or fight them off or whatever. But now it's misguided uh, that that solar plexus wound, isolated, is actually looking for an enemy. It's trying to justify the fear. Oh, I've and, noticed that. Yeah. And it's what's happening so, it's so prevalent you know, we don't, I don't want to talk politics, but it's so prevalent. There is a, a movement of energy that is looking for the enemy and it's looking for something that it can fight because it's not, the solar plexus has lost the connection to the heart, which is saying there really isn't a threat here for this local family, for this, you know, I'm not discounting the real threats on the planet, but in general, there isn't an immediate threat. And yet, the solar plexus is not connected with our heart love, with the love that can um, act appropriately in the condition of life with present love. It is because of that disconnection. It's just, it can't, it doesn't feel complete unless it finds an enemy, unless we do this technique. And as your communities come together, that might be a good exercise. Yeah. I like that. Uh, Maybe I'll have you teach. Well, you can come here and teach it to us. <laughs> I would love that. I would love <laughs> yes, indeed. I do a cannabis meditation once, about once a month, and um, because I believe that cannabis, it has been a elevating teacher plant for me, and I believe that. I've been trying to think, I haven't asked anybody to meditate on any specific thing, but this might be worthy of that. When I was looking uh, in my book, I, I talk about clairvoyance and growing up as a clairvoyant and, I, and 
between worlds and so forth. But I remember, you know, so I grew up in the 50s and 60s and, and 70s. Um, I remember looking at the different beings or devas or plant devas or those different names. There are, there are spirits that are associated with particular species like, you know, like, uh, well, there's to tobacco plant, there's, you know, marijuana plant, there's other kinds of plants and they have a distinct being that oversees their, their function and their life force, the transmission of life force to whatever degree on the planet. And I remember looking at the, um, cannabis kingdom and was in marvel of the profundity of their purpose and um it was as if it was like a, you're looking at a very old soul of a human being even though the child might be three or four years old you can just sense that yes that um wisdom that they bring it was similar when i was looking at the that cannabis uh and and uh, the re let's see. I wanted to say that one of the things that I noticed that was unique or almost unique was the the awareness of the of the spirits of that plant to to morph or to change its influence depending upon who's in the in the room or who's out, who's who's involved with them. Most plants they don't have that uh, ability. Ability, or they don't have that, that gift to actually interact. It's, it's, it's actually beyond, I don't quite understand how it works, but I didn't just watch how they would morph and change their influence depending upon who was looking at them and who was with them. Yeah. They seem to amplify whatever is going on with the person. Yeah, yeah, right. It's their, it's their spiritual journeys, right? And of course, like anything can be abused and, and uh, it got involved, you know, the power of that plant got involved with all kinds of abusive control and society, you know. Mm -hmm. all the one thing I feel strongly about is, uh, you know how pharmaceutical companies find out about these healing plants and then they isolate the uh, active ingredient? I'm totally against isolating or concentrating. I think you need the whole plant. The plant has its own wisdom. And when they isolate and make concentrates and hash and stuff like that, they're pulling out what they consider the active ingredient, but the plant is more wise than we are. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's the, you know, herbs versus chemicals you know the herbs carry the devas they carry the spirits with them they're linked to them so if we're taking you know whatever it is even aloe vera has all of those those spiritual elements that uh that actually make the healing so that's a good example so you put aloe vera on a cut and a burn it's not just the chemical construction of the aloe vera that's working that's why I guess the pharmaceutical companies or chemists can't can't duplicate. They can't make fake aloe vera or synthetic aloe vera. They just it's not not possible. They can't make synthetic anything. They get well, side effects right. they didn't expect because they took out the buffers. <laughs> yeah. And these linkages to the other worlds, you know, this is mm -hmm. anathema to a to a conventional pharmacist, pharmacist. but it's something that we we know we we are not isolated chemical beings and neither are the plants and the, and the seeds of the plants and so forth. It's the connectivity that enlivens and each plant has a certain role in a certain position, just like each human and each animal, you know, mother earth has worked all of that out for us previous. Took thousands of years, thousands yeah. and thousands of years. Yes. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. And this is a golden time and a, challenging time simultaneously it's the opportunity of our own healing identifying those those places in ourselves that are that we are resisting and uh, the wounds that we have inherited and, and accumulated along our own lives and 
uh, being able to use, the, being able to access the special dispensations that have been given to humans through the shamanic world, through the different beings of light that, uh, that only uh, require our request or our asking of them for help. And there's certain prayers, you know, and there's certain rituals that make it more profound and powerful. But more than ever, I see it more than ever, they are available for each human being and humans as a whole to really uplift and get through this dark time. And Robert, how did you first hit get the call to go into this kind of work? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I grew up seeing things and for, you know, the clairvoyant. Okay. So uh, I thought, you know, I went through all that wondering if I was crazy or mentally ill and, <laughs> and <laughs> all that stuff, you know, teenagers, and, you know, not knowing where I fit. But most profoundly, I had a near, my first near death experience was in 1979. And I saw these different dimensions and I came back and saw the different dimensions while I was coming back and saw that uh, there are um, resources of, of love and the existence of the um, cycles of time that were moving humanity automatically and that our opportunity was to interact with that uh, blossoming movement. So I, I was a musician at the time, so I, I quit the music industry and that's when I really because I, I saw these, you could say I had the visions. Shamans sometimes have visions, often. So the visions were very, very clear that we have, uh, we have, I, we have the opportunity, the gift of participation in our own awakening, our own collective blossoming of love, and we, we can almost say it's our obligation once we see that yeah. uh, it's kind of like if you don't see uh, somebody that needs help on the side of the road then you know you, you can't help them because you don't see them but once you see them then somebody then you, it's a human obligation to to try to help and participate so um i suppose that's my short story on how i got involved in 1979 and never stopped Cool. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> this is a, great for us. And I'm understanding that you're going to come to Grand Junction, Colorado. I would love that. I look forward to that. Okay, cool. Um, what else did I want to ask you? Something. Of, oh, I'll get to it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, here, let's do this. If one of your community were to be given the microphone and ask me a question or ask you a question, what do you think that question would be? Um, why is ceremony important? That's an excellent question because this, so everything is energy, including our thoughts. So let's go back to that one being that is the one being of 7 billion humans put together. And so that one being has various attributes and it has an aura and it has uh, thought forms. It contains thought forms that have been the product of a long time of our beliefs, our thinking, our, our uh, agreements, whether they're right or wrong about what reality is, what life is and so forth. So those are, it's, it's like a, um, a blanket covering our eyes when when the sun is, is out and we can't see the sun. That blanket is the collective thought forms of humans and not just in, you know since the beginning of, of ascensions. Now the, the ceremonies were given to the shamans and others to be able to break through or find the find the openings through that blanket of primarily fear-based thoughts and beliefs that are uh, limiting beliefs. So when we just, uh, I mean, I've been around a lot of enlightened people and masters and shamans 
And uh, when they close their eyes, they need to protect their aura or they need to strengthen their aura to be able to, to serve directly from, from light or from unconditional love, not from any kind of uh, conditional hidden agenda place. And if you don't do the ceremonies, there's a danger you can get into a certain pocket of thought form and it might feel and even seem to be very truthful. Often those those levels talk about the same things we talk about, love and peace and all the great things that uh, our hearts love resonating in, but yet there there is a hidden agenda there. They, they need to use people that are embodied and stuff and, and it's a bit complex, but the uh, the ceremony is to make sure that the connection with our highest good, with the highest good of all, is is clear. It is not being interfered with. That's the function of, of a ceremony. And it's also the why the ceremony shouldn't be taken for granted. And there should be a uh, kind of a uh, uh, full-bodied interaction with the ceremony or full emotional and mind, mental capacity to interact with the ceremonial um, techniques and, and programs because if it's just the mind and we're you know it doesn't really work so uh that's the importance of ceremony on it and it can be called preparation ritual but it's very very important these days that's the main thing i'm trying to bring uh, mm -hmm. that's the main thing i'm trying to bring to people is ceremony very important I, I believe so. It's kind of risen to the top of my... Yeah. <laughs> I was like, people call and they have different programs to present, but usually I prefer some... Definitely there should be a ceremonial component. Very, very important. It's also just in a sense, gets us out of our own way. Ceremonies generally involve giving up our attachments to certain things so we're serving a greater greater good a greater um, part of ourselves and that in that uh, uh, surrendering into the, the greatness to the great beyond to the great heart of all hearts is um, gets us out of our own so not only do we bypass hidden agendas on other realms, we bypass our own. <laughs> our own hidden agendas. <laughs> our own hidden agendas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for uh, sure, huh? I was, do you remember when um, those people died in the sweat lodge? I've heard those stories, not specifically. I don't remember one particular story. Tell me. Um, a man named James Ray, he was one of the authors of The Secret. Okay started giving uh, big workshops, big um, retreat things, and he started incorporating a lot of Native American practices, but he didn't, he wasn't doing them correctly. Dangerous. And people died. Yeah, so the shaman has that responsibility. In general, the shaman has the responsibility to keep the initiates alive and in fact the whole idea of a sweat lodge is to go is to poke through the veil and 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 die for an instant or two and the shaman's on the other side making sure that, that it's just for an instant <laughs> right make sure that there's a, a rebirth coming back into the body with the wisdom with the initiations complete that's yeah, I, I, so I, I'm, it's a good thing I don't know exactly what you're talking about because I can't, it's such a tragedy uh, if, uh, if the shaman is not qualified, then bad things can happen. Yes, I was particularly disturbed because I had just returned from Hawaii where we did sweat lodges four or five times a week. And I knew how they should be. 
And here was this man who charged these people $10,000 for this. They each paid $10,000 and three of them died and others suffered permanent damage, oh. kidney and liver damage. We need to respect the ancient wisdoms much more than our intellects can categorize what they do. You know, yeah. oh, it looks like you go in there and you sweat. I, I mean, again, I don't know this this gentleman, and, and I don't mean to you know, where he's at or anything, but uh, shamans, the true shaman, carries the, the uh, often the true shamans, ones that I've met, they do have the key to life and death. They do have that key. They do the, They do know the doorway and go in and out, back and forth. And uh, the talking about thought forms that affect our physical, physical forms. We all, most humans believe that if we don't get enough water, we're gonna die or food, we're gonna die. And there's all these beliefs that are just penetrating each one of our cells to, con to conformity, to conform with those beliefs. The shaman has the ability to disengage those beliefs from human mass consciousness and our own individual uh, subconscious and even conscious mind. But in so doing, then you can go either way and the shaman has to have that golden key to know that back from the higher dimensions or from the, through the death portal is the, is the objective, <laughs> you know, is to come back with an enlightened perspective and wisdom right other worlds give us right <laughs> let's see what other questions did i have what is your favorite ceremony that's a great question my favorite ceremony i do one every day and it's it's a uh, uh, I do it's in my book, and it is um, it includes Sanskrit prayers that I learned. It's a way in which I honor life. I honor life in its multifaceted reality and its past and present and future simultaneity and that um, the ceremony involves the reversing of my pattern of waking up from sleep and then finding myself with the specific identity oh I was born in 1954 and I, all these stories about me come in you know this is mm -hmm. my my sheath and uh, uh, you know, my body's con consistent. I don't completely morph every day. You know? <laughs> Wake up with a different face. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but there is an opening within that recognition of totality, of the recognition of, of free, unconditional love that can be integrated in the in my in my individualness, and that's the ceremony I do every day. Okay. Wow, that's nice. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Well, thank you for being on our show today. Julia, it's always a pleasure. It's my second time and I enjoy you so much and your community is so valuable, so powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And we're looking forward to seeing you in Colorado soon, I hope. Likewise. Yes, I look forward to that as well. <laughs>